Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, how can we let go of our adultness and play? And I'm in conversation with Greg Bottrill. So my name's Greg Bottrell and I'm the author of two education books called Can I Go and Play Now? And the other one's called School and the Magic of Children that just came out in April. And I'm also the creator of the YouTube series, um, which is called Play School TV. Um, And all of those things explore play, which is what I'm incredibly passionate about. That's my life in a nutshell. (laughs) So it's all about play. Why is play so important to you, Greg? Um, well, um, I was, I used to be a, um, an early years leader an assistant head teacher in a primary school. Um, and I was lucky enough before I went into train in education to go out to Reggio Emilia out in Italy. Um, and out there they have, um, a, a sort of education system that really values children. Mm-hmm. And it was a real eye opener when I went It kind of consult, con- sort of, um, uh, coincided with the birth of my my daughter and um, I just slowly began to see that children had something about them that they were magic Um, and I hope every parent believes their children are magic and I would also hope that every educator believes children are magic Um, and it kind of I don't know I saw saw it as it opened a door because I do believe play is like a door that you have to step through and once you've stepped through it you never want to go back (laughs) <laughs> tell me more about that so what happens when you step through that door <laughs> through the door well um you realize that children are trying to tell you something okay um, they're trying to show you something they're trying to show you how to live um they're trying to remind you of your own childhood um i'm a great believer that our our identity is born within our childhoods um and unfortunately uh education systems in the western world much of the western world um deny us who we really are um they take away our creativity i I greatly believe that children are born mathematical and uh the system because it is a system um and takes that away from us and i've I've said you know and and i think you know if you've got your own children most parents would see that our experiences our own experiences of school I think if we held a straw poll and we asked adults who's good at maths Mm -hmm. most adults would say that they're not but that was what they were taught by school and so I'm really just interested in how play and more specifically how childhood can come alive within our education systems because I believe it absolutely can especially with in early years or in early childhood as I prefer to call it. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of, that's my, my greatest passion is trying to show that play, it's not just about, it's not trivial, it's not fun, even though it is, mm-hmm. it's something far deeper and, and richer than that. And so am I understanding correctly then that you kind of feel that this is something that we're born kind of able to do, but we kind of unlearn it over time? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm an adult who's not very good at play. I'd like to be better. Mm-hmm. So what do I do? I need to copy children or I mean, how does that? <laughs> um, in, in, in a way, in a way, it is kind of like that. Um, we are, you know, we are as adults. Um, we, we kind of sort of center around the idea that we are the ego and we're the controllers of learning and we're the controllers of, of, of children. But children are actually, they're full of ideas and wonder. And maybe in our own childhoods, maybe we didn't have the opportunity to have that wonder. Maybe we had to learn it for ourselves over time. You know, not everybody has a great childhood. I, I accept that. But children are trying to remind us of what life can actually be. And I often talk about the looking for life in the small corners of the world. Children, they, 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 are, they, they see, they just see things differently to us. And, and it all comes down to this idea of the cardboard box, how children see a cardboard box. Me as an adult, um, I see it as something 
really frustrating that I've got to break up and recycle. It becomes something impractical. Whereas a child will see the infinite opportunity and potential within that box. So it's something I call the seventh sense. All children have it to a degree. They see through the objective reality that we think the world is. Mm -hmm. And they see the potential, the infinite potential in everything. So that's why things like a wooden block are really, really important for children because the wooden block can be anything. They can interpret it with their seventh sense to become anything. So in terms of the toys that we choose for children, it's really good to try as best as we can to try and choose toys that are open-ended so that children can interpret them. And then as parents and as teachers, because the teacher and the parent are, they're both teachers. Going back to the Reggio Emilia, um, where I went to it, it, out in Italy, they believe that the first teacher is the parent, yeah. the second teacher is the, chi- is, the, is the teacher, and the third teacher is the environment. And the teacher and the, and the parent are kind of like the electrons going around the child, and it's about listening. Okay. Often in our education systems, we're very quick to tell children to deliver because what we have is we have a system whereby um, we want to test children to prove the value of the education system. So all of this is adult world stuff. It's just the adult world trying to prove to the adult world that it can do its job. But what happens is children and childhood gets put to one side. And a classic example of that is today, the government have announced that the phonics screening test is going to be come back in for year one children in the autumn term. So we've been through all of this coronavirus upheaval. Children, yes, children are resilient, but many will be coming back frightened. Many will be coming back with great mental need. Ultimately, what play holds for them. But the government, the Department of Education, have decided that the children need a phonics screening test. And to me, it tells me where we value children in in this country, that we don't. We don't value childhood. And it's that thing with parents is trying to show parents that we need to. We need to value children. It's not just parents go to work and children go to school and it doesn't matter what children do. It matters hugely hugely even more so now i would argue and you know knowing knowing your work i would hope you would you know i I reckon you would agree with me absolutely i think that kind of yeah play and nurture and creativity feel like the most important things for me right now what do you think the children should be doing instead of a phonics screening test and all the prep that that would uh mean well it certainly doesn't need to be done in the autumn term when children come back that's not the thing that they're confronted that they need to be confronted with it needs time and unfortunately that's that's something that the adult world can't seem to give children children need time that's what parents need to give children is time time to be time to be around time to be to listen to chat to explore together um the, the the kind of sort of pedagogy that i talk about in my in my two books is about this idea of co-play. The adult and the child play together. So the adult kind of steps down and allows the child space and time to wonder and to question, and the adult questions and wonders together. So it's rather than the, ad- the, the child has to get up to the adult world, the, it's almost, it's more of a collaborative, cooperative approach. Because ultimately, what play does, because it's in your DNA, and it's in my DNA, it's in everyone's in our bloodstream play. It's how we make sense of the world. You can't, no matter what the adult world does, they will never take play. That's its strength. They'll never take play out of children's DNA ever. They can't, no matter what tests they put in, they'll never take it away. So the idea is that play is a gift to us. So if we go into play, if we open up that magic door and go into the world of play as a co-player, yeah. as an adventurer, then we can sprinkle skills over the top of children. We can do reading and writing and mathematics, but we do it through their play. And so it's just, a, it, it flips the way that we see education where the child has to you know where the, where the adults up here, the controller of learning, whereas ultimately it's about letting go of that control and allowing children freedom and choice because it's the freedom and choice that make, that make who we are. 
So how do you become an effective co-player if you're perhaps used to a um, slightly more rigid routine, maybe you're a teacher who gets how to prepare a child for a phonics test and you know, you, you're in that system. How would you step out of that and become a co-player? Well, it's hard. It's not easy. Um, it's not easy because the system as it stands isn't about co-play. It's about the delivery of knowledge. Mm. And it's about children being compliant to the teacher. Um, it always frustrates me when the BBC put photographs online of the classrooms and they always put a photo up of children behind a desk because mm. it just reconfirms this idea that learning only happens at a desk, but it doesn't. Children aren't programmed to be sat behind a desk. Um, there's, you know, the, the, the children need to be active. They need to be outside. They need to be able to explore but it needs i mean i talk about teaching from the soul mm -hmm. and that's what we need and that's really hard because it challenges everything the way i was brought up to be a teacher i was taught to be in control of children but it wasn't until i the door swung open and i stepped through that i saw that my control was actually holding them back what i was doing is i was diminishing who they could be i was shaping them just to pass a test mm -hmm. but the test isn't who they are and we want, and by, by the way, saying that we don't, I don't want, I, you know, about testing children, it's not to say that we don't want to give them skills. Yeah. We absolutely do want to give them skills, but we want to give skills as a gift, not as something that they have to do. So writing is something you have to do. You know, writing is a really incredible gift, isn't it? It's the most amazing thing that you can make marks and yeah. someone else can interpret it yeah. and either understand, I mean, you know, or not understand, you know, if you write on Twitter, well, whether you understand or not understand. <laughs> but it's about showing children that play extends into language. You can play with words, but you can't do that if it's just, you teach phonics so it passes a test. That's just, it's dead. You're just teaching dead language to children because all they're doing is doing it so, to, to be compliant to pass the test. And that's not a criticism of teachers at all. It's a criticism of the adult world yeah. that demands this from children. And, you know, to me, you know, reading, again, like reading, I mean, what a gift that is to give to children. To be, you know, if we looked at your bookcase now and we, oh, you know, we went to the orange shelf and we <laughs> opened up the book and we could take something that someone has taken out of their brain and put on a piece of paper, what a gift to give children. And yet what we do is we create these systems like book band books yeah. which if you've got your own children are the most dullest thing in the world. <laughs> you know, I can't, you know, cause, cause teachers don't read book band books to children at the end of the day. Why don't no. they? Cause they know they're boring. So we say to children, well, you can have that book band book and this really beautiful book, like the giant jam sandwich or whatever book it might be. This is the real stuff. You have this fake stuff. So we're just giving, you know, when we do that, we've got a system that's telling children that reading is quite boring, but it isn't. It's the most amazing thing, I would hope. And judging by the number of books on your bookcase, you, <laughs> you <laughs> I can as long see your books are in color me. order. I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, teaching from the soul sounds like quite a bold and brave thing to do. Tell me more about what would that look like. Like, take me into you know one of your classrooms, say. Because, but well, teaching from the soul is about the connection that you have with the children in front of you. Mm -hmm. So it's about going into the children's play to understand who they are. So children not only have got magic, my belief is that they've also got a mystery. They're telling you about childhood and they're telling you about themselves. They're telling you how they interpret the world and how they're interpreting themselves within the world. Okay. So it's our job to make time and space to go into that, to go and learn from children. So again, it's this kind of flip, if you like. And ultimately, what I'm not then doing is just taking a teaching scheme or a topic and saying, I think this will do, or I taught this last year, so I'll do it again. Yeah. That's not teaching from the soul. Teaching from the soul comes right from here because it's almost like if you didn't do it, then the world of, I talk about the world of good things. We want the world of good things for children. Don't we? I, I think we do. I think children deserve it. They deserve adventure. They deserve magic. They don't deserve just tired kind of just regurgitation of stuff. And to me, the only way to teach them the soul is through play. Mm -hmm. And those, I talk about play and not play. So there's play, which is where children 
are choosing for themselves mm -hmm. and they are playing with whoever they wish to play with in and they are interpreting the world and then there's not play they're the moments where i call them to me to teach them a particular skill that i know that play can't quite do as in if i'm going to teach phonics for example mm -hmm. i wouldn't necessarily just stand in the middle of the room showing you know 30 children flashcards because they they're not going to look <laughs> and also you know the richness of their plays far better but then i do a bit of not play a bit like coming to a base camp mm -hmm. and saying on the adventure right this for this next bit we're going to need these skills and i talk about tight teach so that's like a tight teach of not mm -hmm. play and then into open play so the two work together okay so like to co-play is is like you go into play and then at moments children come to you as well but they only come to you because at that moment you've got something magic to show them whether it be a story whether it be something to do with phonics whether it's you know something amazing about number um and all the time in the play yeah. what we do is if we're co-playing we're just popping up skills all the time because play doesn't recognize a curriculum there is no curriculum in play you can take learning anywhere literally anywhere so how do you plan though i mean you don't <laughs> you can't you can't plan play you can't plan for the children you but you can plan for you okay. so for example if i know children are struggling with a certain thing i plan what they need in terms of the skill so mm -hmm. then i'm looking at what they're doing within their play as to how i can sprinkle it over the top but they're not defined by that next skill. I will just see where the play will, 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 will take them. So the traditional model of teaching is you plan for the children. Yeah. But this model is you plan for yourself. Okay. Because if we accept that play is choice, I don't know what children are going to do. And that's the biggest thing that stops co-play. It's the biggest inhibitor for teachers who won't play because they've got to let go of control. Yeah. and we're raised in control so it's so it's like you, you you have to then but you do get the control back in a way because you're planning for yourself you, you know what you're going to do but you don't know what the children are going to do oh i feel a bit edgy just thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's but that's it, it's huge it's 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 a really big way of it takes it takes faith in children massively um, and we mustn't forget, it's not just the children don't just come in and play all day. Some, mm -hmm. some places do that. In my version of co-play, there are those moments when children do come to you. Okay. Because I want to open up some kind of magical gift to them, whether it be a new math skill or, or what have you. But children will then be operating yeah. within the room, in the play that I have created for them. Mm -hmm. Like I call it like a learning landscape that they're going to go in. They're going to have an adventure. And you know what? I'm coming with you and we're going to go and explore this together. And it can be, it can be really, um, it, it can be really difficult for, for teachers to do. The main thing is, is it's about childhood. And when does it end? When does childhood end? To me, it doesn't end at five. No. And it doesn't end at six or seven or eight, nine, ten. I don't know what, you know, I personally would say it doesn't end until it's 18. And part of childhood, to my mind, is that children need choice and they need to be able to collaborate, not be sat at red table, green table, blue table, yellow table mm. and be defined by their ability because play doesn't see ability. Yeah. Do all children come with the kind of the skills and the understanding and the confidence to play well or are there things that you need to teach and establish to um yeah there's certainly you have to have what i call play parameters you have to have rules yeah. um you you know it's not a free-for-all and again part of the difficulty of play because it's freedom the difficulty that ad the adult world has with play is that they haven't set it up and they haven't controlled it so they worry about what's going to happen yeah um, and that's perfectly natural. Um, and sometimes it can feel, it can seem like you don't know what's going on, but the children do because it's their play. Yeah. And that's where when you go into it as a co-player, you begin to understand the mystery of what's, what's going on around you. Um, certainly there will be, um, you, you need to have those play parameters in place 
but you agree them with the children, not don't do this. Because mm -hmm. that's just control. Or if you do this, I'll give you a sticker. So again, this whole idea of just rewards for children yeah. creates the culture where children are doing it so that you are pleased with them. Mm -hmm. But that's a false morality to my mind. It has to be, I don't do this because I believe I shouldn't do it. Not, so, not because the teacher is going to reward me with star of the week or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. So it's trying to, because children are really capable of negotiating their own parameters. What kind of parameters are we talking about? So we might talk about, say, um, how we might use a water, how we might use water, because obviously some children may think it's a great lark to throw it at each other. Yeah. But the idea being is that if you're doing that, you're stopping other children from learning. And yeah. it's about trying to show children that they're recognising their value of their play. Because the adult world often talks about you work and then you play. When they go through school, you have a lesson and then you get your playtime. Yeah. The playtime is the reward, but play is the reward in itself. So things like, I used to do things like, I used to pinky promise with my children. So we'd get them all together and we'd make a pinky promise about how we were going to use resources. <laughs> so it became like a negotiation as to, we all agree, this is what we're all agreeing on. If we're going to be inside, we're going to walk. Why should we walk? Well, if we're running, we're going to knock someone over and then we're going to hurt someone. So there's a, there's a sort of a moral yeah. framework that we're working in rather than the adults going, don't run. Yeah. We're doing it more in a positive way, walk. Because if we walk, children have got the opportunity to learn in the same way as tidy up time. Yeah. It's about saying to the children, if we don't tidy up, after we finish playing, the next children that come, they can't learn because we've just left it as a mess. And what we do is we do it together. So I am, I as the adult, I also join in too. I don't just stand in the room commanding children to tidy up. Yeah. We do it together. It's the idea of like, uh, let's, let us do it together so that the children see that I'm no different to them. I'm not above them. I'm taller, but I'm not, you know, and I've got a bit more knowledge, of course. And I've got a big grey beard and a bald head that they <laughs> don't have. Um, but the idea is that we're working as a team. We're a community. Yeah. And it can be really, really powerful. And do you have kind of particular sort of activities or kind of go-to modes of play that tend to kind of work better? Or is it very free-flowing? It can be very free-flowing. Um, I often, again, a lot depends on, the, the, the key to it all is, is the landscape that you set up, the resources yeah. that you enable children to, to interact with. Yeah. So there's a big long list of things um, that, that children you know, really love. And the idea is, is that we're always interrogating and asking what we put out, what skills it's got within it, how children use it, yeah because the moment we start doing that so we, we see ch how children interpret certain objects what it does is it gives us an idea of how other children will do it as well yeah. so children are kind of passing their gift to you which you then pass on to other children that weren't there in that particular moment and children will latch onto it more because it's come from the world of children yeah. not from the world of adults <laughs> because actually children do listen to children far <laughs> more than they listen to adults they like they really do that they really do they learn more from children probably than they do from the adults so if children are learning through playing and your yes. classroom is a place of of play yeah. then what happens at playtime you don't have them you don't need them we just used to just go on through you just okay. have the whole because because playtime is there as the break for children to run around but if you have a play culture as i call it your play culture enables children to choose to go outside because outside has equal value to inside mm -hmm. the learning will follow them maths and writing reading all those things will follow them because it's in them in here yeah. so rather than it being we've done our work and we go outside the children are and again so it's a different way of working you have to forgo your cup of tea at playtime <laughs> on your quick chat in the staff room um but what it gives I, I talk about a play sandwich okay so a, play, a play sandwich is where you do like a bit of not play carpet time first thing it might be some storytelling or something yeah and then you have a big chunk of play and then the other bit of bread 
is a session of phonics at the end or some maths or whatever it might be. So you've given that really big chunk of time in the middle because um, it's that bit in the middle that's going to be the most exciting part. No matter how brilliant your carpet time is, the <laughs> excitement is in the middle because children are now playing and they're showing you the world and they're showing you who they are. And do you um, find that other people that you work with get on board with this and, and come along or is it a bit trickier to get some adults to join in? Um, it's a process. It's, it's, as I see, if you're going to go on an adventure, which I believe play is, then we have to accept that some people are not as far on in the adventure as you are. That doesn't make them less of a person. Yeah. It doesn't make them... Um, you know, they're not, it doesn't make them a weak practitioner. It doesn't, it just means that, that those who are further on in the journey yeah. feel it and are, uh, have, have learned more, if you like. And it's their job to enable the people who are less so to follow. But what it takes is, is great honesty great you have to be in this way of working you absolutely have to be honest with your shortcomings to share them as a team why because, well because if you don't like playing outside for example mm -hmm. you will put in as an adult you will put in a million different reasons why you don't like like why you don't like outdoor play but ultimately the reason might be just you feel the cold mm -hmm. so you so and we're great at adult that aren't we put all the masks up all the personas <laughs> That's, that's what we do really brilliantly. We're really good at that. And we, make, we build all the barriers up. But with co-play, you have to be absolutely, really honest with yourself about your practice. And even those who are further down on adventure, they still have to be honest with themselves. And they have to reflect on who they are because this, this is about, I believe, it's about becoming a really authentic educator because yeah. you're teaching right out of here. And where are your shortcomings? Pardon, where are my shortcomings? I've got loads, <laughs> probably a lot. Ask my friends. Um, well, um, where are my shortcomings? Probably in that often I have been in certain areas and I've not valued them. So for example, I was talking, I, I have, a, I have a, like a mentoring group and we were talking yesterday about how sand, I used to find sand really difficult to play in as a resource. Um, I, I really don't like the texture of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, it I, there's something about it. So I used to find it really hard to go in and play in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't value it as much. But actually what it took was, was the honesty to talk with my team and say, look, do you know what guys, I'm struggling with this. What do you do? How can we, how can I overcome this? Yeah. And so we put in things and I was a leader. And, you know, so I allowed my team to kind of reflect with me and go, okay, let's put these things in place. And lo and behold, what did I discover? The magic of sand. Oh, and really? Now, yeah, now it's one of my favourite places to go. But it's, I, I could have carried on putting up the barriers, couldn't I? All the yeah. time. But unless you're honest, then, you know, you, as an educator, you know, it goes back to you were saying, you know, about this idea of letting go and playing. Tons yeah. of people will be really opposed to that. But ultimately, it's about fear of letting go. That's what we're afraid of. Why do you think we're afraid of that? because we're raised to be in control. We're told, you know, I was, when I, and by the way, I'm not criticizing teachers here, Re really, really not. It's just, it, it just, it's just a different way of, of educating, which mm -hmm. is hopefully, I would like to think, is beginning to emerge more and more. More and more people are, be, are, are finding the joy of it, because ultimately mm -hmm. that's the missing word in education, is, is, is joy. joy. Um, and again, it goes back to what the children deserve. And if we don't believe they deserve joy, then personally, I don't know why we're in education. And that goes all the way up to the top of the DFE. If you know, if we can't see that joy has got something to do with it, I question why we're in there. But anyway, um, but ultimately, yeah, it is. It's it's we we are we are trained in our teacher colleges and universities how to do guided reading, a, a lesson plan, all these things. But yeah. what we're being told is is how to control. Yeah. You're told how to do behavior management. Most behavior management comes back to the adult world. We set up, we set up rules because what we try to control controls us. Mm -hmm. The more you put in control, the more you, 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 you stress about what you can't control. 
And then what do we do? We blame the children. And then it's the children that, that you know, they miss their playtime because they didn't do this or whatever, you know? So what does behaviour management look like in your classroom? It, it looks like joy. It looks like enabling children to be engaged because the moment children are engaged, behaviour tends to just go whoosh, because the children want to be there. Mm -hmm. they, you know, I used to have children and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I, I'm not the perfect teacher. I'm, I'm really not. I'd like, I, I'm, I want to become the perfect teacher. That's what I want to be. But, you know, I had children that did not want to go home at the weekend because they loved school so much. Aww. They wanted, because they knew they were going to get, like when I, when I was in there, when I was around them, something good was going to happen. Yeah. They knew it. They knew because I was the co-player. I was going to show them something really cool or I was going to listen to them and value them. And if you're five, you need to be valued. You know, again, it goes back to this idea of the government's baseline test that's, that, they're, that they're trying to do, you know, for, you know, they're talking about, I know they've kind of postponed it for the year, but ultimately children coming into a school and in the very first few weeks, the adult world goes, here we go, have a test. Mm, mm. And that's what it is. They call it a baseline assessment, but it's not, it's a test. And what it's doing is it's telling children that the, they're going to get pushed to the side of their own lives you're not important and it, that's what it is we don't fact your play is not valued you do what i tell you to do when you're in here so the idea is is that you have these you, you have a, a, a in terms of behavior management my way of doing it was to have an agreed set of rules with the children yeah that they recognized and that if children went outside of those parameters the yeah. children would say that's not fair because okay. we agreed this. So they're self-managing. They self-manage it because ultimately they want to play and learn because what you're trying to do is create the culture where play is valued. Yeah. Because if you value play, you value children. If you don't value play, I don't, I don't know. I, it's an open question as to whether you value childhood because the two are together. They're, they're inextricable. And when does play kind of fizzle out and stop? I mean, I'm thinking at the moment about the wider reopening of schools in the autumn. And I've talked yeah. a lot to um, colleagues in EYFS and primary about play and colleagues in secondary are saying, well, what about us? Does it matter for us too? Do children need to play as they return? And what do you think about that? In secondary school mm. or just generally? Uh, in secondary school in, in particular, school. Do, should we be encouraging play? I, I certainly think we need to encourage the echoes of play. Yeah. In terms of, you know, I, I, I often come back to the idea of show, not tell. We show children, but we don't directly tell them. We have to, you know, children are born curious. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, when, when babies drop their food out of the high chair, they yeah. want to know where it goes. And they look down. They don't look up. They look down. They're learning through their curiosity. They're learning about gravity in a very, very simple baby brain. Yeah. That's what they're doing. And so, you know, ultimately the question is, is when does it end? You know, my, my son's now, or my daughter's 18, so she's finished her, she's done with her secondary education, but you know, my, my son's 14 and he's at an amazing school that actually really do encourage them to be curious. There's lots of project work that goes on and it's not just do, 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 do. And they're one of the most top, you know, they're the second top performing school in Devon out of all of the schools, private and independent, they're a state school and they're led by a head teacher that gets children. It's cool to be who you are. That's kind of their ethos. And it's not about just do, 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 like machine gun teaching. <laughs> they just, they give you time and space to follow your interests and use those as best as they can. So I greatly believe it is about this idea of the echoes of play, okay. which is why play is so important in nursery. Yeah. That should be like, like really humming with play. And then it kind of goes up. And as you go through, because the curriculum gets, you know, this idea that the adult world says, you've got to have all this knowledge. You've got to know, you know, what a fronted adverbial is at the age of seven. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. And, you know, if anyone, anyone can explain to me where the joy of a fronted adverbial is at the age of seven, I would love to go and have a drink with them because there is none. 
There isn't. Well, my daughter's actually, I remember her literally crying over fronted adverbials when she was about that age. Um, and she was crying and crying and crying. And I kind of was like, what's the problem, Lyra? What's the matter? And all I could get from her was fronted adverbials. And I just, yeah. I didn't, it just was a foreign language to me. I had no idea. I couldn't help her. So I didn't understand what the problem was or even what those words meant. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. And, it, and it's kind of like what we generally value within our education system. These are the big, you know, these are eternal questions that will ever, you know, they've gone on for, for years. And the fact that they've gone on for years is ultimately to the shame of our, our education system, I suppose. You know, my, my, my son can, can do the most absolutely amazing kind of uh, fractions and algebra that just leaves me just like, wow, what is that at the age of 40? <laughs> Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of him because actually he's got an amazing sense of justice. Um, you know, he, he, he's an amazing boy, but does he really need to know about all these fractions and, you know, et cetera, at the age of 14, if he didn't have a really good sense of self, which mm -hmm. comes first? Is it the sense of self or is it a fronted adverbial at the age of seven? I would argue it's a sense of self because we're going to need children to be the adults who are creative and the problem solvers and not just be the robots. Mm -hmm. We don't need robots, but we really don't. No. And how do we support children who might have um, sort of special or additional needs, for example? Is there any additional work that needs to be done there to enable them to play or do they? Yeah, um, yeah there can be. I mean, um, just thinking about children and actually my own son, um, so autistic children, and let's, generally speaking now so I'm, mm -hmm. i recognized you know there, there's there is a you know, i don't want to be too kind of like judge but um they can find it quite hard to play in terms of imagination mm -hmm. um it can be quite limited um in inverted commas what i did was i created something called play projects um and which is in my second book, School and the Magic of Children. And play projects is a way of putting a framework over play okay. to enable children and the adult world to see the value of play and its opportunities. Um, they're an amazing way to work with children. And um, where we've done it in schools, and I did it in my own school where I had two um, uh, uh, quite, quite high functioning autistic children, but they found imaginative play quite difficult. Yeah um that, that it just was transformative because it was like the adults had just shown them what play is to start with yeah i was gonna say it's appealing to me but then i'm an autistic adult who didn't really ever learn to play so uh yeah yes. give me a script and uh i'll give it a crack <laughs> yes well, it's kind of is like that it's it's a bit like um it's 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 like it what it does is it dissects play so we talk about play and this is yeah. the problem with the adult world we talk about play but what is play Mm -hmm. and so I've done lots of work in my second book the school and the magic of children on breaking it down as to what it actually is and what's the answer what... <laughs> mm. <laughs> well there's 10 things along the way <laughs> I'll try to remember them but one of them one of them is about is creativity and it can be can be something I said I'll talk about I'll, I'll talk about my own son my own son found very difficult mm -hmm because he he just couldn't get past that he would line cars up and count them but he couldn't role play with the cars particularly it wasn't his fascination and you know at the age of three he could count you know beyond 200 it was you know it, it was yeah i know it was it was amazing some alarm bells should have been going off in my brain at that time we should have known a bit more um but ultimately my son taught me how to parent that's what he did he showed me that i needed to change Okay, in what way? Um, well, because I, I kept on having all these demands of him as a parent that I thought that's what was parenting, but ultimately I needed to listen to him. And it's that idea of listening to children, which then created the play pro this idea of play projects, finding out what they didn't understand or mm -hmm. did understand, and then create the framework to put over the top of play so that children can see the breakdown of it. So there's like building blocks of play. Yeah. And then you can then model to the child, to those particular children how to how to play. Yeah. And often what it did was it just, I don't know, it just pushed open the door and then they were away. It's a really beautiful way. To, it is a beautiful way to work. I mean, I would say that because I created it, but <laughs> it, it is, it, it's, it, the impact is, is, is huge. 
Uh, where have you kind of tried it out or who's used it? Um, I used to do it in my own practice. Um, and there's, well, whoever's read my, I mean, my second, it's in my second book. Um, and it's something that could, in theory, be huge coming out of lockdown. Yes. I've, I've pressed pause on it because I don't want it just to be associated with lockdown because play is not just for lockdown, it's for life. So I've had this kind of like, Ooh. Really, but it is. And so, and I didn't, and so I've got something else called Drawing Club, yeah, which is equally as impactful with children, but I've not really done anything with them yet because I want to, for September to come around, right, let's go. Because they can, they're, they're both really, um, yeah, they're, they're really exciting ways to work with children. But the schools that have explored them already have been, have been there's one school that have been exploring them going up into year six. Yeah, all the way up into year six. So what they do is they take play up with the okay. children. Okay, okay. So you kind of held back a little bit from these projects, which would be really helpful as we leave lockdown, because you don't want them to be associated only with lockdown. If I understood that right. Yeah. So, so I mean, so if you if people have read the book, the second book, yeah. lovely, they know about it. Yeah. But lots of people hear about my work because I do workshops with them. Yeah. Around them. Yeah. But I, it can't just be a lockdown thing. Okay. And it's not a lockdown thing. So I'm kind of, and again, there's been so much emotion all around mm -hmm. lockdown with, you know, government advice, 30 different documents coming out every week, you know, washing hands and, did it, you know, it would just get swallowed up. Mm -hmm. But now schools have got a chance, hopefully, to just breathe a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, crikey, schools have worked. They have worked so oh, yeah. You know, unbelievably hard under really challenging circumstances um, and I think they've been forgotten a little bit along the way um, what I'm hoping is come September I, we, it, then it will start picking up because I've also got something called Adventure Island I was going to ask about that I saw that on your website <laughs> tell me about Adventure Island well Adventure, Adventure Island is um, a way of creating um, a whole new realm it's a new dimension mm -hmm. to explore. So it's, to, it's make believe. Okay. Um, and I created it last year and it was just taking off. So what does that, I mean, was it? <laughs> what, I still, I have no idea what, what, okay. what tell me more. <laughs> okay. So, so the idea is you create a landscape of the imagination with the children. So, through thinking, talking, making, building? I think it's, it's all make-believe. So to begin with, you just tell the children that Adventure Island has popped up outside. Now, okay. can, if you're four, can you imagine how exciting it is to know that Adventure Island's popped up? You know nothing about it, mm -hmm. but it links in with something that I developed called the Message Centre, which is a way of writing with children, which is extraordinary when it goes. And it's all about using secret symbols and hiding and finding, because the mm -hmm. idea of giving the joy of phonics as a gift mm -hmm. and then there are certain characters that live and if you've watched play school tv you'll have met some of them along the way um, there are certain characters that live on adventure island and so it goes from there so the children then go on an adventure when they go outside and there's a whole host of imaginary characters it's a little bit like the bridge to tirabithia if you've ever read that or or watched the film okay mm -hmm. if you haven't it's an amazing book okay. and an amazing film but it's basically a make-believe world yeah. that you visit with the children and characters come and characters go, challenges come yeah. and it's beautiful. Wow. And because it's a collective thing, what happens is um, in the group that, that people can join, there's a way then of sharing. So for example, there's one, one school has created characters called BitBots and BitBots are like drones that fly around. Ooh, okay. And those BitBots to take messages, but those BitBots then can then be sent to other schools. So, okay. so, Adventure, so Adventure Island is being done around the world. So yeah. even if you're in Thailand, Adventure Island goes all the way out there and back again. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it's an extraordinary way to work with children. It really, it really is lovely. And what was lovely today, someone messaged me and just said, this is the recovery curriculum that children need. It's just rammed with joy Aww. and creativity. It is beautiful because, you know, um, did you know the story Bog Baby? Yes. yes. You know, yeah. So um, you use, and there's a min pins as well out of Roald Dahl. So you use characters that the yeah. children are familiar with, uh -huh. as well as creating new ones. 
So the like, new ones are like characters like Grandpa and the Poggle. And the bog babies, you, so children then go and make detectors for them and because they, they live under the ground. Yeah. And the bog babies follow them home. And it, it's just lovely. And the greatest thing about it is the parents buy into it massively. I was going to ask about whether parents are up for this they or not. It. They absolutely love it. I've been inundated in, in lockdown with people sending me photographs of parents who have kept it at home because everyone lives on Adventure Island because you believe in Father Christmas if you're from that tradition and you believe in the, fa- and the Tooth Fairy. And both of those live on Adventure Island. Ah. You already live on it, but you use it as an educational tool because yeah. there's problems along the way to solve and numbers and the characters leave various things for the children. And it's just super exciting. Isn't that just kind of hiding learning in play if there's numbers along the way? And... Um, it's kind of like that, but it just, what it does is it's the emotional connection to learning. Okay. So if, you're, if you're sat at a table doing a worksheet, who are you doing it for? You're doing it for the teacher. Children aren't stupid. They know they're doing it for the teacher. Yeah. Whereas if you're on Adventure Island or in play, who are you doing it for? yourself and instantly you're connected to what you're doing and the moment you're connected to what you're doing my belief is is you're truly learning because you're learning for yourself and not for the adult and that's the beauty of co-play so does learning all have to be fun to be impactful do you think no no it's no it doesn't have to be um it would be good to try to make it be it's it goes back to this idea of it not necessarily just being about fun it's to me play itself is a moral imperative there's no choice to give children play Mm -hmm. because it's inside of them and it's who they are so the idea really is to try to say to ourselves okay so how can we especially in early childhood Mm -hmm. make sure children get this adventure so back off with all the formal sitting at tables just let leave that if we want children to be joyful in their learning let's give them you know if we really want children to be writers and readers let's give them joy when they're five yeah not an hour of phonics just so that we can say that they can pass a phonics screening test because that ain't joy so i guess it's about kind of tapping into a motivation really isn't it making them want to engage absolutely because that is that they've got it It's, it's like an energy Children are dark, they're desperate to play. Yeah. Tell me about Play School TV. So I've, <laughs> I've, I've had, I've had a, a bit of a look at it and it looks, it looks really fun. I, yeah, like lo- lots of, of you in the woods and your lovely dogs, Bonnie and Epi, having, yeah. having a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea with Play School TV is, um, so lockdown came, of course, um, and there was quite a lot of schools who were, who were really interested in Adventure Island. So basically Play School TV is me on an adventure with my dogs. We meet all the characters along the way on Adventure Island. And what I'm doing is I'm modeling. It's, it's like one, hopefully, I and mean, lots of children watch it, but the idea is it brings joy. Mm-hmm. It brings learning. It shows that learning can go anywhere. So for example, there's apps to my mind, there's nothing wrong with showing three-year-olds how to count in 100s. Mm -hmm. you do it because it's not the curriculum it's just it's joy it's about playing with numbers and playing with words so often in the program i would just make up silly rhymes or because what i'm doing is i'm playing with ideas yeah i'm playing with this idea that because really adventure island is a living storybook it's not fixed which is one of the beauties of it because you have children that will come to school who will have a real like rich canon of stories that they've been read yeah. And next to them will be children that don't. They haven't been, I mean, I call it book snuggled. They haven't oh. been book snuggled with. So the children that have been book snuggled cross pollinate with the children that haven't. They lend them. As soon as you go onto Adventure Island, you can guarantee the gingerbread man will pop up. Yeah. That, that these characters will come from traditional tales of three little pigs. But if I haven't been book snuggled, I won't know them. So yeah. the children share their their uh, their sort of literacy if you like yeah but the idea of play school tv is really to model this idea of show and tell yeah and the adventure 
So the schools that have really got involved with it, they often watch it and then the children are desperate. Weirdly, they're desperate to go to Adventure Island. <laughs> Weirdly, they don't believe I'm real. They believe Bonnie and Eppie are real, but they don't believe I'm real. Why and do you I, think that is? I have no idea. I went into a school the other day in Bristol and walked through the dinner hall and there was this, because <gasps> I because they watched Play School TV and there I was. And one of the children just went, where's Bonnie and Eppie? That's all they're interested in. <laughs> But that's kind of why they're, why they're there, because ultimately, you know, they don't they don't know who I am. There's no there's no there's no emotional connection to me. It's to the dogs mm. and the dogs in a way are that curious because dogs and animals play. Yeah, they're the players. They go on, you know, and, and it's all done normally in one take. So I'm just literally. I was going to ask about that. Do you kind of carefully plan it and script it? And... No, no, I, I, I know I know the learning that's going to be in them and I know the storyline, if you like. But the actual content, I just have to go with the dogs. I have to go with their reactions or I, I have, you know, if it looks like they're coming towards me, then they've brought an idea to me. I'm giving all the, the secrets of Play School TV. But, you know, I'm just recording on my iPhone. It's just the idea is to create over 100 episodes that over time can be like a teaching resource so that yeah. when people go onto Adventure Island, they've got it as a way of, oh, OK, that's what the Poggle does or you know, this is where grandpa lives. So there's an episode, a couple of episodes where we go into grandpa's house. He's like a really grumpy character. And um, I couldn't take the dogs in with me because it's uh, uh, it's a, an abandoned building and the guy that o o owns it didn't want the dogs in. So I had to pretend that the dogs had been kidnapped. You know, can you imagine the age of five? <laughs> Your brain, I, I was, I'm loving, I'm loving going on these adventures with you. Okay, so the dogs have been kidnapped. You're <laughs> in an abandoned building, which is where an the grandpa building. lives. And so to get through, it's a bit like the Crystal Maze, to get across different rooms, I had to, to read or recognise certain numbers or mm -hmm. use different words. So again, trying to sprinkle language over the top of, of what happens. Mm -hmm. And then across the five days, I ended up finding Bonnie and Epi. They'd been shrunk and put up the chimney in Grandpa's house so I could rescue wow. them. And then, of course, there's like a secret word that we've got to read. Mm -hmm. And then that brought, brought them back to real, real size. So they're okay again now and they're, they're back to okay dog size. Now. Yeah, they're okay. But this week we've got Ooh. the character Smeech. And um, Smeech is, a, is the queen goblin and she litters Adventure Island. So it's a week just trying to kind of explore litter and okay. tidying up. I could have used the Wombles, I suppose, but Smeech was, was just... Was I like Smeech. Smeech <laughs> is great. So you're aiming to get over 100 episodes. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah so I'm on episode... You're quite a long way through, no? Yeah, seventy-eight. I've done seventy-eight, yeah. um, but I'll just keep going. I mean, when 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 I begin to go back to travelling again, um, to go and do training in schools, I'm hoping to um, to still do it, and I'm also looking along the way. And if there's anyone watching who's got one spare to give to me, is to take a van out and go and do Adventure Island with the van, and go into different places. Oh wow! So yeah, it's um. Yeah, I don't know. It just I'll just keep doing it as a I love doing it. And you know, the feedback's just been amazing. Do you do it every day? Is it a daily thing? Uh, it's a daily thing. The episodes come out every day, but I record yeah. I record all five episodes in one morning. Okay. Um bon Bonnie, who's the little Jack Russell, she she you'll probably if you if, if people watch it, they'll see she's very reluctant. Whereas Epi just is all over me. Bonnie <laughs> just takes one look and she I, if she finds it. I don't know, she just walks off. So often you just have to, I have to talk to Bonnie off camera quite a bit. Um, yeah. But Epi just loves it. She just loves it. Have you had any um, sort of moments where someone's kind of come across you talking to your dogs on your phone in the woods? It's only happened once. There's a, <laughs> there's a character called Hoddy Dodd, who's a giant. And there's a particular part of the, um, of the wood. Uh, where uh, there was like some big dips in the ground and I was pretending that there was footprints in the ground and um, I fell into it and I just looked up and there was this guy just staring at me <laughs> but no it's it's a you know it's a it's a really big wood um, so you can I can normally find somewhere where it's okay but even if they did it doesn't matter you just have to shoot it again <laughs> I wonder what they would think. That's it. I was, as I was watching it earlier, I was just thinking, I wonder if anyone kind of comes across you. And, and then actually, what do you think, you know, if, if they do, do you, would you explain it to someone? Yeah, or? yeah I've, so, so, some people are in, you know, as I've been walking through, I've, I've, I've got my, my phone on my, on my tripod. Some people ask, 
some people have recognized it some of the local children watch it i've got like mm -hmm. a little brick outside where i live which has got holes in it mm -hmm. and i often leave messages for the children in the brick oh, wow. and they will leave messages for me and stuff from the from the, from from adventure run which is quite sweet that's really um, lovely so yeah they, they love it so yeah it's good fun so you'd normally then if we weren't in lockdown you'd be traveling around talking to different kids in different schools what what does yes. your normal role yeah. look like yes i tend to um i i tend to be invited into schools go and work directly with with teams excitingly increasingly beyond early years as well which is really good um that that really makes me happy when i get to work with key stage one because it means that schools are really trying to explore the mm. joy of learning um but yeah so I, and i do conferences as well um but i also work with some local authorities along the way um just to kind of support them in their work um certainly um leeds for example are really really excited about the potential of adventure island um and i'm hoping to go there next year to go and do some work with them but of course we kind of need to come out of all the yeah you know it's not an easy landscape at the minute for, for particularly for nurseries you know they've been decimated by this and you know they need to focus on their future at the minute yeah it's just totally sensitive and what do you think is the the kind of the the role of play as people do return from lockdown i mean you've you've alluded quite a bit to the fact that people are recognizing that it's going to be important um, and you don't want this just to be a, a moment in time but presumably there's the potential here that as people recognize the importance of kind of play and nurture as we return that it might ignite something that could continue that's 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 my greatest wish yeah it's not it's you know the, the, my, my message isn't that you've got to play all day every day you know that would be that would be foolish to say that because mm -hmm. you, you, there's no way you could do that not if you know if you're in year five and year six you, you know it you, it just wouldn't it wouldn't work it just mm -hmm. wouldn't work but what it's about is trying to say but how can you make the how can you find the echoes of play how can yeah. you at least give children some choice and creativity and real collaboration how can we do that bit and do it genuinely yeah. and and not be you know not everything's got to be an intervention Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know you can you know you the greatest thing with co-play you can really work on the minutiae of learning with children in those yeah. moments um you know i've done it in year two where um with the my approach to the message center which is all about these secret messages etc but part of it is the magic of words and words make things happen like magic mm -hmm. spells yeah and the moment you sprinkle spellings over the top of children's creations to make things happen yeah. their spellings just go because they want to do it rather than yeah. having a spelling test so it's just about recognizing well we've got a curriculum but can we do it in a way that gives children space yeah. for choice and it's that bit i think i would really try and encourage schools to do and what's uh, you know do you have any advice in terms of practical steps there that that teachers and and support staff can take in terms of integrating play in that way in a meaningful way well that's where my play projects come co comes in and I've, and yeah. certainly with with schools that i've worked with they've they've tended to have um in years one and two they've tended to have maybe more sort of let's use the word formal or added yeah. directed mornings and then they've tried in the afternoon to run play projects either once or twice a week. Yeah. What happens is children come in and demand them <laughs> and then you've got to do them. And that's what's lovely. And about the play projects that if people wanted to find out about those, they're all in your second book. They're all in, they're all in my second book, um, School and the Magic of Children. And I'm also going to be over the summer holidays. I will be creating some tutor video tutorials on on can I go and play now dot com that because some people access training better yeah on a tutor on a, on, a, on a tutorial so it'd be like a it'd be like a walkthrough but certainly where I've done uh, in my own um, in my subscription uh, mentor group we've talked about event about play projects with them and the people in that group were just like oh my goodness this is it. So I know they, I mean, they absolutely can work and they're not, yeah. they're not difficult to do. Okay. It just takes the step of faith to trust children that they can direct their own learning. So a bit of a leap of faith there, but then people will learn from seeing the results, I guess. That's yeah, of course. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because the thing is, what happens when you allow children to play, something happens to you as well as an adult. 
you start to transform. You start to just, again, it's not, it's, it's, you just, it's like your soul starts to feel good. Wow. That's deep. <laughs> but it's true. It's, it, it is. It's like a, it's, it's like a, uh, it's like a rebirth. It is like a rebirth. But that's going to take a certain amount of trust, I guess, isn't it? Trusting in the children, trusting in ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's about it, it's about that openness to letting go, just yeah. letting go. And letting go isn't about losing learning. And it's not. A, it's just about saying to children, right, have some space, and you're still there as the co-player. That's yeah. the thing. So when you do play projects, you're just going in and you're sprinkling skills over the top of what children do um and it's a really really beautiful really beautiful way to work i mean when i've done it in schools i've did one in a school they hadn't the children hadn't played for two years and i did it yeah they hadn't done, had any play for two years and i said right we'll do play projects we set it up and the teachers were like this isn't going to work and did it work yeah it absolutely did because the children took ownership of it and the teachers were just like mm. and they could see <laughs> Because what happened was the children had shown them and they did, they brilliantly just allowed children to show them what they were capable of. How come they were up for play if they hadn't done it for all that time? What, what changed it? Because I was there. But why were you there? <laughs> As in, you must have been invited in? Or? I was invited in. The head, the head teacher wanted to explore how to enable more play in the school. Okay. But that's not, that's not an easy thing to do in terms of the training that we have as teachers. So that's why play projects can, can, can really work because it that is helps the scaffold it. Framework. and they could, they could just see it. Yeah. Um, and so we just did it as like a trial thing, 60 children and the outcomes were just extraordinary. Aww. So if people want a starting point, then it sounds like play projects is a, a good kind of way in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and hopefully this, this coming year as, you know, touch wood, the world begins to open up in whatever way it does I can begin to kind of get out and you know it's not about trying to show people that are doing something wrong it's no. not that I'm doing this this will sound a bit mad but I do this really out of love because play is love when we give children space to play we're valuing them we're seeing them that's my belief so right. I do this to try and support teachers on their adventure into play all you all teachers have to do is want to go on the adventure and then it's that moment as soon as you want to go on it that magic door does appear and then it's about stepping through what thought would you like to finish with i think it's important to leave in people's <laughs> mind something deep go on greg <laughs> um i think i think probably i think i just go back to this idea of childhood being this chrysalis for identity and that play is childhood they, 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 they are that you cannot separate them and play is learning and it's the most valuable type of learning and ultimately it's a gift to us as, as educators we can step into the children's world rather than bringing them out of their world into ours if we go into theirs then it is it's it's a it's a it, it's the most incredible place to go adventuring in it's like going into narnia and who doesn't want to go to narnia 